I was also born in Missouri. And that's about where my similarity ends. I know nothing about script writing. Um, the last time I spoke to a school was about five years ago. I was dating a woman who had a child, and there was that whole bring your parent to class and tell what you do. And I make games for a living, and so they thought that'd be cool. So I volunteered to go for her child. And I went to the school, and I, I brought along a demo. It looked not, like, not too much unlike this where I had graphics and cool stuff going on, so all the kids loved me more than the firemen. <laughs> so one of the kids asked what, I, what my job was, and I said I was an entrepreneur. And I went up to the blackboard, and I was going to write entrepreneur, but then I thought, oh, I'll be clever. Does anyone know how to spell entrepreneur? And, of course, they were five or something, and so they didn't know how to spell entrepreneur. So the teacher chimed in and said, I, <laughs> which reminds me of the fact that when I was in school myself, in high school, I was such a poor student that I barely graduated at all. In fact, in my senior year, I had to actually do correspondence courses to have enough credits to graduate. I then went on to a college, uh, much like this one, only they didn't have standards. and. And I, and I dropped out. I actually, I spent all my time doing creative writing because that interests me, and I did nothing else. And they didn't let me actually take any computer classes because I didn't have the prerequisites. And I dropped out because I knew I was wasting my time and I was wasting their time because I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to create these interactive environments where people could create their own stories. And back in those days, we're talking 19 years ago now, I'm 40. 19 years ago, um, those were a little thing called text-based games. And I am a big believer in the uh, attention span of Americans. Um, I build products that people don't play, they actually live in for long periods of time. Is there anyone in this audience that has spent, say, eight years in one of my games? Yeah, there's always one <laughs> in every crowd. Um, we have people who, to this day, will spend upwards of 400 hours a month in a game. Now, I want you to think about this because there are only about 700 hours in a month, <laughs> what this actually means. To do that, I created uh, what we in our industry call a platform, which means one sits down and makes a whole bunch of code. And we build an engine, and an engine is a thing that lets you build something wonderful on top of it. And what we built was a game called Gemstone about 19 years ago. And it was a text-based game. So it's like a book, but you're the main character. And everyone's the main character from your perspective, right? <laughs> yeah. And people will go into this world, and they will live there, and they will grow there, and they will have their own hero's journey within that environment. And the people who actually produce the world where this happens are called game masters in our parlance. And we had a team at the time of about uh, eight when we started. It swelled to about 60 by the time you got involved. And these days, there are well over 300 in my company. Um, and they spend their time building the environments that these people play in and the storylines, and not in the tr traditional way in which a which a script is written or a book is written, because in a script and a book, you have control over what someone does. But this guy here will do whatever he fucking wants, and I have no control over that. So what I have to do is create an environment. I have to create obstacles and circumstances. And then when people engage against those things, I have to be prepared for any potential outcome. So it's like writing a storyline where anything could happen, and you have no control over it. And it takes a team to do that. And I should say that it... At some level, being an entrepreneur is all about actually the team. Entrepreneur conjures this idea of the Wild West and the lone gunslinger, but it really isn't. Because no success that I've had, and I'll do about 20 million this year, is attributed just to me. It's to the people that I brought with me, that I met and convinced that my way forward was a good way to go. And in the recognition that there are many things I don't know how to do. In fact, I don't know how to do most anything, but except I can identify talent in other people, and I can motivate those people to my vision. And that's the key to success in business.
It's not what you do. It's what you do with the people that you convince to come with you. And there's a second part to this, which is the sharing part. Because although I started the company, from a, and it's still a privately held company, at this point, I own about 30% of it. All the rest of it is owned by everyone else in the company. And as time goes by, I basically just start giving out more and more of the company in, term, in, in you know, stock and incentive stock options and that sort of thing. So that everyone is, as we say in business, rowing in the same direction. And that's really the key to the whole thing. Because the motivation that, that I have as an entrepreneur is driven by uh, this, what I call vision, uh, other people might call uh, mania, which is there's something I want to do, and I'm going to do it no matter what it takes. And I didn't care about making money, except for the fact I wanted to have things. But the, the actual making of the money wasn't, the, wasn't what drove me. It was this vision of building something. And I had it since I was a child. I don't even remember when it started. I never had a day in my life where I said, what am I going to do with my life? I always knew. Even when computers were an impractical thing for something like this, back in the days of the TRS-80 Model 1 and that sort of thing. And, but I knew what I wanted, and I just stuck to it, and I kept doing it, and the rest followed. But it didn't follow until I learned that it wasn't a solo operation, until I brought other people with me. And then I realized that not everyone has the same drive, right? Not everyone is built to be an entrepreneur. I'm not really sure where the line is, because there are people who are motivated and people who are very talented, but they never go out and strike out on their own, at least not at first. I don't know what it is. Maybe they don't have an idea. Maybe they don't have, uh, maybe they're risk averse because it's all about risk, right? And so those people, although they're not entrepreneurs, they can be great employees or great partners, right? Great executives and things like that in your company. And many of the, of the top um, executives in my field uh, at other companies, like uh, John Smedley, who's the CEO of Sony Online, they did EverQuest and all of those. He used to work for me. So I've trained dozens and dozens of people and set them free when they grew too big to be just part of what I do. And there's no hard feelings in that, right? You know, that's part of it because as an entrepreneur, it's not just about yourself. It's kind of like, when you get into it, you realize that it's a community in of itself, that there are people out there who have that same passion, although it may be about something else, like writing a script or whatever it is, but they have that passion, and there's like a bond you get with those people because you understand what it's like to want to do something so much you don't care about anything else. I mean, on a day-to-day -day basis, you want to get your tank filled with gas, but at the same time, you know what it is you have to do. And all of those people help each other. And so it's a huge community. There's always this premise that business is like swimming with sharks, right? Like you get out there and somebody's going to come and eat you if you're not careful. And sure, it might happen. But I have never seen it happen. I've seen the opposite every time. It's all about how people get together and do something. Every time I go out and I talk to people in the business community, the discussions are always about how we can work together, not how we can destroy each other. And even my greatest competitors would constantly talk to. And it's not about keeping your enemies, you know, you know, keeping your friends close and your enemies closer. You just don't think of them as enemies. You think of them as friends. Because at any moment, there may be an opportunity for you to work together on something. And the whole thing about business is about exploitation of opportunities, right? I was once told that... Uh, Someone came to me one time and he said, uh, he, he was telling me how he thought I was lucky that I was doing what I love and I was making money and all this kind of stuff. And then I said, well, luck has nothing to do with it. And he goes, how so? And I said, well, from my perspective, luck is really a combination of two things. On the one hand, it's, it's this idea of being prepared, right? And on the other hand, it's the idea of opportunity, and it's the confluence of those two things, where opportunity and luck meet. I mean, opportunity and preparedness meet is where luck is. If you weren't prepared, all the opportunity in the world will just pass you by. So what you're doing here today, right now, is preparing so when the opportunity comes. And so where will the opportunity come? Well, the thing is, opportunities are around you every second of the day. You don't even really notice it. 
at first. But as you start preparing more and start talking to more people or just seeing things in the world that should be a different way, like what's his face who came up with Ikea? I mean, how many times have you tried to put together a piece of crap furniture, right? You know, And someone said, well, I could do it better. You know, It's just the simplest thing. Starbucks was the same way, you know, where coffee houses were, were kind of like not places where people wanted to hang out. And then what's his face? I'm bad with names. He went, <laughs> he went overseas and saw that, you know, there was this whole community built around the idea of, uh, of coffee houses and he built Starbucks and that sort of stuff. Opportunities are everywhere, but you have to be prepared for it. In my case, it wasn't school. I was a terrible student. I hated school, cursed every day I was in it. And I left. And I have since convinced many, many other people to leave school. So I'm really a terrible person to be here right now. Uh, many of the people who worked for me were in college when I discovered they were talented. And I said, you're wasting your time being in college. But these were truly exceptional people who really didn't belong in college. They were wasting their time because they already knew what they had to do. They were already there. Not everyone's like that. So there are other people I have who have gone to, on to great schools. I have artists who went to SCAD, for instance, which is an awesome college for artists down in Savannah. And, um, and of course, I've also sent people to school, like my executive vice president, I sent to get a Wharton MBA, which was one of those accelerated programs where you do it in like 30 minutes and it, <laughs> it may sound like, like that's cheap, but I mean, it was like, it was like a year, a two year program where they take the, the four-year degree and compress it into two years and it's all executives people who actually are in the business field to begin with so it was an amazing experience and Wharton actually used my company for many of their uh, for some of their worst research projects and that kind of thing so it was very helpful to us as well I find that the hero's journey the idea of moving through these phases like you outlined um, doesn't resonate with my personal experience actually I I find that it's more like uh, like, you know, just the laws of entropy, right? It's like you're applying force in some direction. I want to achieve whatever. And everything in the universe conspires against you to make that happen, right? Everything costs money, and there's never enough of it. And people are people, and employees are employees, and if you know what I mean. And, and you're, you're, when you're running your own company, you're not simply dealing with the idea of making rational decisions. Right? Because people don't actually think through all of the options and weigh every op everything and then come up with some perfect solution to a problem. This isn't how it works. Studies have shown that the way leaders make decisions is they look at all the options and they take an intuitive glance at all of it and come up with the answer based on that information right there and then. It's like right away. And that's what business is like. It's constantly making these little micro decisions all the time. And you hope that you don't screw it up. But you have no reason to believe that you won't, except that you've been successful up to that point. And I've made lots of mistakes along the way, and some I've paid terrible prices for, and some I've, um, I still regret. And there are people I've hurt even along the way and didn't realize I was doing it. But that's all part of being business, because it's, business isn't really separated from the idea of human beings, because a business is just human beings. I was talking about uh, this weird idea of money, um, because Online games like this have virtual currency, right? So they're gold pieces or whatever. But what many people don't realize is that those money, that virtual currency in the game is exchanged not only between players directly, but through external exchanges with real money, right? So this virtual currency that exists in like Gemstone or the new game we're working on, Hero's Journey will have, or World of Warcraft, is actually bought and sold on black markets external to that with real live U.S. dollars. And in some places, virtual currency is eclipsing the value of real currency in Korea and places like that. And, but, but here's the funny thing about it, and this goes back to the whole idea of being an entrepreneur. Any day of my life, I could decide to go into my game and completely crash the value of my currency. I could just create an infinite supply of gold pieces, and suddenly an individual gold piece is worthless, right? But in the terms of the game, that ruins the game, <laughs> But what about the people who actually have bought and sold this with real life money? Because there are people who have actually made their entire livings off of the currency of these games through exchange. In real life, I mean. I have bought people mansions unknowingly. 
But the fact that I can destroy the value of that currency at a whim is something you have to think about because there's no difference between the virtual currency and our real currency, right? Money is only valuable because we believe it is. It's not tied to anything. If we all decided that a dollar was worthless, then it would be worthless. We're not tied to the gold standard. And even if we were, gold is only valuable because we believe it is. Now, how many people have ever been to a mall? <laughs> have you noticed that they sell gold by, like, giant chains in every mall? What about diamonds? Have you ever been to a mall and not seen a billion of them? Why are they valuable? It's only because we believe they are. So in the end, we're fighting for this virtual stuff that has no meaning. And you find as you go along, the one thing, the thing that you really remember is not how much money you make. It's not even the battles that you fought. It's your interaction with the other people involved in your journey, right? So if you go back to, like, Lord of the Rings, it wasn't about Sauron. He was a pussy. <laughs> Let's face it, he never won a battle. At what point in that entire story did the bad guy do anything but lose? It's about the friendship, right, the fellowship. And I find in my own company that it's the same thing. It's the fellowship of those that stick with it. I have an incredibly low churn rate. Most of my people have been with me for years and years and years and years, which, by the way, is extremely unusual in the computer game industry, which is very, uh, very uh, mercenary. We about time? Good morning. And the way I've done that, of course, is, like I said, having them all buy into it and then incentivizing them and rewarding them appropriately by giving them a piece of the pie. And as we go along, giving them a bigger and bigger piece, even if that means I have a much, much smaller piece, because it doesn't matter, because if I can just make the pie really, really big, then I don't mind having a small slice. But it isn't just about money either. It's about the fact that people can come to me with their own ideas. And I, my favorite thing is when someone builds a big presentation, especially with a PowerPoint, and they want to make a big presentation to me. And so we'll go into a conference room and they'll start going through it. And about halfway through, I'll usually go, why are you showing me all of this? And they'll get all like, oh, what'd I do? I'm like, why didn't you just say you wanted to try something? <laughs> it only takes like one or two times of that before they realize that the whole idea that I try to foster in people is this idea of risk taking, right? Like I will never, ever fire someone for taking a risk and failing. In fact, in my entire life, I've only fired one person. He deserved it. <laughs> so despite the Donald Trumps of the universe, I like to think of business more as a family and an extended family, all the other companies you ever touch in doing your business, wherever it is, because everyone can work together to try to achieve more. I've never once thought that my role was to be a leader I never thought, I want to go and lead a whole bunch of people. But in the end, leadership really is all about just vision, right? That you're the one guy who can look out ahead and say, this is where we need to be, and convince others around you to go in that direction. I spend my life now traveling around the world and doing demonstrations. Um, I stand up in, in front of large groups, and I don't do any talks like this. I use highly technical talks, and I show demonstrations of this thing behind me. Um, but it's been eye-opening. This past year, I've been all over the world. Last week, I was in Paris, and the week before that, I was in Kiev. And uh, in December, I was in Moscow, places I never thought I would stand. I was standing in the center of Moscow thinking, wow, this is where I used to think about our missiles being targeted. <laughs> <laughs> and I have found that in the rest of the world that... Just going there is the most amazing, eye-opening experience you can have. So if you're going to be an entrepreneur, one of the things you really want to do is travel the world. It's kind of a weird thing to say, but I really believe in it now because you start to understand more about the nature of human beings when you go to a place where they don't speak English, but you can still connect with people. And you can be treated really, really well. The best I've ever been treated in my life at any company I've ever gone to was the one I visited in Moscow where they took such care of us it was amazing and they would give us gifts this watch for instance which is designed to handle emp explosions and things like that i <laughs> it, they were worried about that and probably rightfully so <laughs> at one point uh but 
to go to these places and, and sit with people who barely, you know, you, you, you're trying to communicate highly technical things, and, and I don't speak that much Russian, and they speak, everywhere else speaks English, by the way, we look like idiots, but, um, but to, to find that you live the same kind of lives, right? And even though I'm in Kiev, so I'm in an Eastern Bloc country again, and there's all these people that are working in conditions that would not appeal to us, the buildings they're in. They're doing the same thing. So I'm at a computer game company in Kiev, and I recognize it, you know. I know these people, even though not, some of them don't even speak English. I know them, and they know me. It's the same thing, no matter where you go. I've had an amazing journey myself in the last year alone, just traveling around and talking to people all over the world. And I've learned a lot about myself in doing so. And I think that as an American, and, and I don't mean to push a stereotype, but um, th the fact that I don't really understand prior to this how insulated we are here. It allowed me to real, really get a grasp on that and how our worldview is so nearly focused over here. Just watching the news in another country tells you you have no idea what's going on in the rest of the world. And, but the fact that I can do business in a place like Russia is pretty amazing to me. Because when I was growing up as a child, it was the Cold War, right? And so I was worried about whether they would blow us up before we blew them up. And now we're doing business together. It's an amazing thing. Even our old enemies are our friends now. Someday in the future, I will go to Iraq, I think. <laughs> and I will meet a company there that's doing games. And it will be 20 years from now at this rate. But someday, it'll come around again, right? And where the enemies are will be our friends. You just can never tell. Anyway, thank you very much. I think we're done.